I'm Pastor John Anderson. This is a little book open. The book that we're studying is the book of Daniel. So I hope you have your Bible handy. Open it to the ninth chapter of Daniel, and we'll go through the verses one by one and ask God for meeting. We're going to do that by having a prayer as we open our study today. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the information that you have given to us. Information that shows that you know tomorrow as well as you know the past. And that your plan will come to a triumphant conclusion. So we pray for your blessing that we will be given understanding today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. Daniel chapter 9 contains the very eloquent prayer of Daniel. He expresses his sincerity in this prayer by wearing sackcloth and ashes, by fasting, by acknowledging the sin of his people. Eleven different ways he expresses the idea that, that the nation of Israel has sinned. And he's not talking about them. He's talking about we. He puts himself right into it. It's part of his humility and his contrition. He acknowledges God's justice in allowing them to go into captivity. He appeals to God's mercy that he would act for his own namesake. And he expresses the idea that, that uh, do not delay in the fulfillment of the promise of the prophecy. So after he prays, he receives, a vision, he receives a visit from Gabriel. And what we have seen is that there were nine links, nine important links that tie chapter 9 together with chapter 8. The information that Gabriel gives in chapter 9, beginning in verse 24, relates directly to the vision of chapter 8. Why? Well, in chapter 8, Daniel had the vision of the ram, the goat, the horn. And when Gabriel came the command was given to him. Gabriel, make this man understand. And Gabriel went through many of the features of that vision, but didn't say too much about the time period that was included in it, 2,300 days. Daniel now, as he realizes that the 70 years that were predicted by Jeremiah, that they have now come to an end, he's hoping that that 2,300 days is not an extensioning, a lengthening of the captivity. And so in his prayer, he appeals that God will not delay in the fulfillment of his promise. And we said that this prayer is very much a model prayer for Christians who live in the last days. To confess our sins, to be honest in acknowledging where we have strayed. To acknowledge God's justice, appeal to his mercy for his own name's sake, and ask that there be no delay in the fulfillment of his promise. So Gabriel comes back. And the information that he gives now in chapter 9 is going to help Daniel understand about this time period. He mentions that there are 70 weeks, 70 sevens, that are in a special way allocated to the Jewish nation. That's verse 24. If you have your Bible open there, verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy nation. 70 weeks. Seven days in a week, that means that there are 490 days well, we're going to see that this time period that is mentioned is given a starting point. It's when the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem is given. Well, we know that that was centuries before Jesus came. And yet, within that 70-week period is the coming of the Messiah. So the only way that this time period can be understood is by applying the day for a year in symbolic prophecy yardstick. Scholars, students of the Bible have acknowledged this through the centuries. You have to apply each day in the prophecy as being a literal, literal year of history for this to make sense. The question is, why is it then that scholars don't, don't use that same line of reasoning when coming to the 2300 days of chapter 8? After all, the two chapters are inseparable. They are intricately connected. And if you want to look at it carefully, chapter 8 is the one with the symbols in it. Chapter 9 is more explanation. And yet scholars have been uniformly consistent in applying the day for a year and symbolic prophecy rule in chapter 9, but not in chapter 8. And we don't understand that. We believe that it applies in chapter 8 as well. 2,300 days slash years. Just as in this case, it's 490 days slash years. It's expressed as being 70 weeks, 77s. And it brings to our mind the question, is it possible that that 70 times 7 is used somewhere else in the Bible? Is that anywhere else in Scripture that 70 times 7 comes up? 
Well, the answer is actually yes. In Matthew 18, Peter comes to Jesus with a question. And Peter, he must have been uh, getting frustrated by having to forgive a certain brother who offended him a number of times. Now, he knew that in their day, the rabbis taught that you have to forgive somebody up to three times. After that, you're under no obligation. That was what was the popular teaching of the day. He suspected that Jesus probably would not accept that because Jesus was very forgiving and forbearing. So when Peter came to Jesus to ask him about this, he came up with the number seven. We don't know exactly how he came up with that, but maybe he said, well, the rabbis say three, so let's double that. Let's make that six. Let's add one more for good measure. That brings us to number seven, which uh, is a special number we know. So he, he came to Jesus and he asked this question. He said, Lord, this is Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? He thought that's being pretty generous. That's more than twice as much as what the rabbis say. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Very interesting that Jesus would use a phrase that we can see has linkage to Daniel chapter 9. The 70 weeks, 70 times 7. And as we're going to study Daniel 9, we'll see that it has to do with the Israelite nation being on what we might call probation. It's expressive of a termination of God's forbearance. Now, God is very forbearing. God is very forgiving. But it is possible to cross that invisible line beyond which we place ourselves out of God's mercy. That's very, very sad. Now, think back. Go back in history. If you go back to the time of Abraham, when Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, that's about 18 centuries before Jesus came. Or if you choose to take it from the time that the Israelites left Egypt and went to the promised land, that's still 14 centuries before Christ. Through that time, the Lord had hoped that the Jewish people, the Israelite nation, would be his people, his covenant people. They would be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. They would demonstrate what godliness and godly living was like. They would preserve and proclaim the knowledge of the true God and true worship, not bowing down before stones and wood to worship them, but to worship the creator God. That was his hope. And yet what do we find uh, throughout Old Testament history? For the majority of time, for the greater preponderance of the people, they didn't live up to this calling. They fell back. They became worse than their neighbors, the Bible said. For that reason, the Lord allowed them to go into captivity as a disciplinary, a redemptive move that hopefully they would return and they would not fall into that pattern of sin again. So this 490-year period was in a special way allocated to the Jewish nation to live up to the covenant terms, to be God's people, to be the light of the world. And we find that idea expressed in the ministry of John the Baptist, as he said, even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. If it does not bring forth fruit of repentance, the tree will be chopped down. Everybody knew that, that that tree represented the Jewish nation. Later in Jesus' ministry, he cursed a fig tree, and it was to teach that same lesson, that if the fruit was not there, then the tree would be removed. In a parable that Jesus gave, he told the made it very, very clear that if the husbandmen, those that had leased the vineyard, did not return the fruits to the master, that that leasehold would be removed from them. So in many ways, this concept of the Jewish nation on probation was embedded in the prophecy of Daniel 9, was alluded to in the ministry of John the Baptist, the teaching of Jesus, and so on. So what actually happened, as we know, sad to say, was that the nation that God called into existence to proclaim the coming of the Messiah and the leaders of that nation were the very ones that put Jesus on the cross. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine. But the leaders of the nation that God had called into existence to proclaim his truth, his love, were the very ones that passed the motion in the Sanhedrin to put him to death and then pressured Pilate to put him on the cross. So what was God to do? There you have the Messiah coming and fulfilling the mission of dying for our sins, coming from the grave triumphant, and now 
This is the news, the present truth that the world needs to hear. That God's plan has been successful. The Messiah has come and died for our sins. He's risen. Now he's appearing on our behalf in heaven above. Question, could God put that message within the hands of the Jewish nation and expect that they would spread it abroad? And the answer is sad to say, no, of course not. They were the ones that put him on the cross. They were the ones that, that lied about uh, the disciples seeing his body from the grave. So how could the Jewish nation be expected to carry forth the news that Jesus had come, died for our sins, rose from the grave, and has gone to heaven to appear on our behalf? God had to look in a different direction. And that direction was the Christian church that was raised up of Gentiles and Jews. It was the Jewish nation that was rejected in that role. But individual Jews, of course, were still eligible for salvation and to be a part of that movement if they chose to do so. But the nation of the Jews from that point was set aside as God's special people. Now the focus is on the Christian church. And the 490-year period represents that period, that time of probation, within which the Jewish nation must fall into an alignment with God's plan. So 490 years represents the extent of God's foreparence. The 70 weeks of Daniel 9, Jesus' explanation or response to Peter in Matthew 18. So let's go through the uh, explanation that Gabriel gives. Remember, it's going to help us understand the vision of chapter 8 in a clearer way. Chapter 9 of Daniel, verse, seven, verse 24, 70 weeks are determined or cut off from the larger period for your people and for your whole, holy city. In a special way, they relate to you. Now, what he's going to give now is a series of, series of infinitives. And we recognize that when we use infinitives, Many times they express purpose or objective. We can divide Gabriel's explanation in the latter part of verse 24 into three sets of couplets. Three sets that contain two, two phrases, two verses. And uh, we, we will see that they are set forth in the, in the manner of Hebrew poetry. Now let me pause on that for just a minute. It'll make it more understandable, I hope. In our language, in our culture, we recognize poetry when there is rhyme of sound. You probably have all heard the poem, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And we say that's a poem. It has poetry in it. It has rhyme. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Those rhyme. That's the same sound. For us, that's poetry. In the Hebrew mind, it's not that way. It's not rhyme of sound, it is rhyme of thought. It is repetition of an idea that makes poetry in the Hebrew mind. Now, the most common form of that is what we call synonymous parallelism. And that's where you have one line that expresses a thought, and then you have a second line that basically repeats that. It uses synonyms to express the same thought. And in many Bibles, if you look at the Psalms, writings in Proverbs, even of the prophecies, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, and so on, you'll find that the ones who printed the Bible recognized that as Hebrew poetry and set forth the uh, verses in that way. Synonymous parallelism is when the thought of the second line repeats the line of the first. Antithetical parallelism is when it expresses it in, in an opposite form. And synthetic is where it explains or amplifies the second line, amplifies the first part. So what Gabriel says is set forth in, these, in this poetic form of parallelism. Three couplets that express the objectives, the purposes of the 70 weeks. So let's go through them. We'll read the, all six things there in verse 24, and then we'll talk about them one by one. 70 weeks are determined for your people, your holy city, to finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Three couplets containing a pair of, of, of lines of thoughts, and in the first two, they are in the form of synonymous parallelism. The second line basically repeats what was said in the first line, just using different words. 
So let's go to that first couplet there. It says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. And you can see how that repeats the idea. You have the word finish, and you have the word make an end. You have the word transgression, and you have the word sin. So that is a, a couplet that expresses an objective that would be accomplished within that 70-week uh, period. So what is it talking about? Well, we can think of it as talking about two things. We can think about it as being relating to the Jewish nation itself, that they would stop sinning, that they would no longer transgress and rebel and revolt in all those words that Daniel used in his prayer, that they would actually walk in step with God's plan and share the true knowledge of God, the love of God and his character that Satan has wanted people to misunderstand all through earth's history, that they would be the covenant people to make an end of sins and finish the transgression. That's an objective. Sad to say, we, we uh, see that in that part, from that perspective, it was not successful. The people continued to sin more and more, even to the point where they put God on the cross. So to finish the transgression and make an end of sins was not accomplished in the Jewish nation. Now, obviously, there were godly people within the nation, but as a whole, it didn't live up to God's calling. The second aspect of that first couplet, though, relates to the Messiah and his mission. And it was, of course, as it says there in verse 24, to finish the transgression and make an end of sins. Why did Jesus come to this earth? Satan had uh, accused. He had brought charges against God. God's law can't be kept. And so Jesus came to honor the law and be obedient and to refute the charges that Satan had brought. And in the language of 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says that Jesus came to destroy sin and the works of the devil. Now we're here and we're alive 2,000 years later, but the doom of Satan's kingdom was made sure when Jesus died on the cross, when he said, it is finished. He was saying this part of the ministry the mission is complete. He completely uh, abolished the charges that were brought by Satan that God's law could not be kept. He exonerated the law. He lived a perfect exemplary life as well as paying for our sins by his death on the cross. So when we read that first couplet, we can, say, we can see Jesus in it. To finish the transgression and make an end of sins. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Now the second couplet is also expressive of the mission of the Messiah. By the way, both prophecies that we're looking at, both time periods, the 2300 years of chapter 8 that ends in the commencement of the heavenly judgment, as well as this 70-week period that is going to end in the coming of the Messiah and the completion of his mission, they focus on Jesus. He is at the, the centerpiece of this 70-week period. I bring that up to you now because... When we uh, get further into our study, we'll see how Satan has tried to challenge that. We'll see that Satan has tried to take Jesus out of the spotlight and put somebody else in because he doesn't like it when people understand and see Jesus, see God for who he is. So the second couplet there also is expressive of the mission of the Messiah to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, God's covenant promise was first announced in the Garden of Eden, and people received forgiveness of sins in anticipation of the completion of Christ's mission to die on the cross. The sanctuary service expressed that objective as well, as they brought their lambs, their animals, and confessed their sins over them. But it had to be done in reality. It had to be done in real life. And so within this 70-week period, the Lord is telling them that this will actually meet completion and fulfillment in real time to make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. The word reconciliation anticipates that there are two parties, two people, two groups, whatever, that are at odds. And through a process, they are brought back together and reconciled. They are made one again. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. Paul, in this very beautiful a letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, talks about how we have been reconciled through his death. And we, have the, we can be ambassadors of this reconciliation to the world. That God wants to be one with us. And the, and the 
uh, ladder is in place, the ladder that connects earth and heaven through Christ, we can be brought back into fellowship, into favor with him. So to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, it's talking about what Jesus did when he came to this earth and lived a perfect life and died on the cross for our sins. Now the third couplet, as we mentioned, is not in the form of synonymous parallelism, but it's in the form of synthetic parallelism. They don't really repeat the same idea, but they do relate to each other uh, in, in a way. So what does it say there? To seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So those are objectives five and number six having to do with the 70 weeks. To seal up the vision and prophecy. This can be understood in two ways. From one perspective, we, we know that the parts of the book of Daniel uh, were to be sealed up. Now, through the centuries, uh, Bible students have understood what the statue dream of Daniel 2 was about. What the wild animals of chapter 7, what that was talking about. What the ram and the goat and the horn of chapter 8. But there were certain parts, the parts that are actually un, under focus in chapter 8 and chapter 9. There were certain parts that were sealed up. And in chapter 8, you remember when we read where Gabriel said that they would be, it was to be sealed up until the time of the end. And in chapter 12, we'll come upon that again. Certain parts having to do with the commencement of the heavenly judgment, the, the, uh, the 2300-day year prophecy, were not understood. Now, as far as the head of gold being Babylon and all the rest of those components of chapter 2 and chapter 7, the wild beasts, uh, you can go back thousands of years and find, find uh, articles written by Bible scholars that give very clear uh, exposition on what those, what those mean. But the cleansing of the sanctuary, you find very, very little about what that meant. What the 2300-day prophecy was about, when it was to be, reach its completion, you don't find much about it till you get to the time of the end. And then, as we will see in chapter 12, the time of the end begins at the end of the 1260-year period, 1798. Now, suddenly, there are those who are deeply interested in the prophecy of chapter 8 and the 2300 years. So we can see this phrase here to seal up the vision as relating to that part of chapter 8's vision that would be sealed up until the time of the end when God would bring it forth and, and shed light on it and understanding would be achieved. The second way of looking at it, though, is that to seal up, the word there can mean to confirm or to authenticate or to make reliable. Think back about what we talked about, how the 2300-year period ends an event which cannot be seen by human eyes. When that heavenly court started in 1844, no human saw it. Life on this earth went and nobody saw the, the commencement of the heavenly judgment begin in heaven. So in God's mercy, what he did, as we discussed before, he laid out a timeline. And on that timeline, he plotted dots that can be verified by historical dates that we can see. They're visible. And by that means, our, our confidence can be built that the event at the end of the prophecy, something that we can't see with our human eyes, likewise is totally reliable. And we can believe in it. And we can know that that most important event, remember in chapter 7 of Daniel, we talked about how the judgment is the turning point, the fulcrum of history. God wants us to know when that would begin. So even though we can't see it, because it started in heaven, he puts out a timeline, and along that timeline, he puts down different markers so that we can know, check them off one by one, and have total confidence that the prophecy is going to end in a way that we can have confidence in as well. So seal up has that idea to confirm or to authenticate or make reliable, to seal up the vision and prophecy. And then the last part of that couplet, to anoint the most holy. Here again, we can see it in two ways. It can relate to the most holy one. It can relate to the most holy place. And both are perfectly acceptable and legitimate. Let's think first, first about what the word anoint means. Who were anointed back in Old Testament times? Well, anointing took place when a person began a certain job or commission. 
or role. Who were the ones that were anointed? Prophets, priests, and kings. And throughout the Old Testament story, you can find examples of each one of those as they were anointed. The anointing took place when they began their job. That's an important thought to consider because this vision is going to pinpoint a time in history when the Most Holy One, when Christ, uh, the, the Prince, will be anointed. In other words, the prophecy is not talking about Jesus' birth. It's talking about when he will begin his work. That's when he was anointed. So when was the Most Holy One anointed? Well, the Bible tells us that occurred at his baptism. If you look up the text, Acts 10, verse 38, it talks about how he was anointed with power when the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of the dove, and he began his work. He was commissioned then to begin his public ministry. Now, Jesus was doing the work of God his entire life, of course, and the Holy Spirit was accompanying him from his very birth, of course. But nevertheless, in a special way, he was anointed with power as he began his ministry, which was, of course, having the purpose to tell the people what God is really like, to dispel the shadows of deception that Satan had put upon this globe. So anointing refers to Jesus being commissioned for his work. It was done at his baptism as he began his public ministry. And also, we can see the word anoint as it related to his, the beginning of his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. As he began that ministry, which we be, believe the anointing of that took place on the day of Pentecost, Jesus was commissioned for his work as our intercessor, our mediator, and at the same time, gifts were given to men. Gifts through uh, the Holy Spirit for the people to speak other languages and perform miracles, all for the purpose of announcing that Jesus the Messiah had come, he had died on the cross to reconcile us, pay for our sins, and he is now in heaven appearing for us. We can have confidence as we go through the various parts of the 70 weeks, as we'll do in our next session, that as we check off the markers and we see that history tells us that they were absolutely fulfilled on time, we can have confidence that the event at the end, the beginning of the heavenly judgment, that most important critical event, that is the turning point of history, when the tide is changed, the momentum changed, that that, that event also began on time. And it ushers in God's special emphasis to prepare a people ready to meet him when he comes. I hope that you're among that group. I hope that I'm among that group that will be ready and say, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. May God bless us to that end is my prayer today.